Hi and welcome to Cast It, our podcast here at ITU Copenhagen. Our guest today is Ivan Damgård, professor of theoretical computer science at Aarhus University, Denmark. Ivan is one of the leading figures in modern cryptography and maybe best known for the Damgård Merkel construction, which is the conceptual basis behind the SHA-2 digital signature and many other digital signatures. That's the technology that ensures your privacy on the internet, authenticity of the software you install in your computer, or modern cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. Ivan's theoretical work is extremely famous and uh, of the highest international caliber. He's also a brilliant and very accessible teacher, uh, runs his own company, which makes these things available to society and industry at large, and he's also a very accomplished musician prize-winning in the category of folk. I hope you get a chance to play some music after this interview is over. So Ivan, thanks a lot for coming and welcome to the show. Thanks for the invitation. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I actually, way back in the previous millennium, in the late 1000s, uh, I actually took your class. Yes, I remember. In Cryptology 2, I think it was called. And um, so this is quite a while ago. By that time, I had more hair than you. Now it's the other, the shoe is on the other foot now. Um, interestingly, this was basically before the internet. So this was somewhere in the 90s. Of course, the internet was known to people like you and me, but it did basically play no role in, in greater society. So I learned everything about crypto then, and, and uh, please tell me nothing important has happened since then. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> Lots of really interesting things have happened since then. In, in, in crypto, you know, uh, as a broad area. Um, of course, it's, it's now much broader than it used to be uh, back in the 90s. It, it, it expands all the time. Because the internet is not so much uh, about communicating, but in some sense, what makes the internet actually interesting and important is that we can communicate in lots of constrained fashions, such as secretly or securely. And I guess this is what we're going to talk about today. So basically, I want you to update me on everything I've missed the last 20 years. So I guess, yeah, part of what we're going to talk about. I mean, so, so obviously, um, if you think about it, um, we, we could not possibly have an internet where everyone would have access to everything because it would mean that, that, that people would just fish off my credit card data from my, from, from my communication with the internet, and, uh, from, from the internet bank, my passwords, my, you know... Well, well we, we, would have, we would have so the internet, but it would not be useful. It for would banking. not be useful, for, that's, that's clear. So, so for banking, for trading, for any kinds of, 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 of you know, um, say internal, in, internal communication in, in, in a company that, that wants to keep its privacy and so on. So, so, um, so therefore, we, we have to have technology. That, that, that regulates who can see what. And that's basically what, what, what the cryptography is used for. And it's also used for another thing, which is, which is or will be used, I think, uh, is always to some extent, um, because we are, we are familiar with this idea that, that, that you, you, you as, your, as a person or, or a company as an organization wants to keep its privacy, so keep its own data to itself. Um, but an interesting point is that um, if you can sometimes combine data from different sources, from, from different privacy domains, so to speak, you can get interesting stuff coming, extra value coming out of this. Uh, and that, that's also what cryptography is about. So, so, it's, so I guess the, the folk understanding of crypto, as, as a first approximation, that is crypto is about secret communication. Alice telling something to Bob, and this has been known for, I guess, thousands of years, right? The, the, the art of of secretly communicating messages and has also famously been a driving force in computation, of course. Um, yes. um, yeah. yeah, so, so may, maybe to illustrate what I said before in a different way. Yeah. So, so, so traditional crypto is about revealing nothing to, to the, to the uh, evil outside world. To the third party yeah. that you don't want to. But the problem, of course, is in the inter on the internet, people you communicate with there, or companies you communicate with, uh, you do need to talk to them, but it's not clear they share your interests. You might be talking to the enemy, so to speak, in a certain sense. Uh, and therefore, what you, what you want to make sure I about is what information are you revealing? So uh, I, I, I can use, for instance, the, 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 the example that I just uh, used in, in the talk I just gave here, uh, that, that you, you could think about a plane company, which is about to send off a plane. And, and then you have on, on, on the other side, you have an intelligence agency and they have a list of, of suspects, that persons that should not be allowed to fly. Now, of course, 
uh, if you what you want to know, of course, is, is whether anybody on the passenger list is also on the other list, so th because they should be taken off the plane. Both parties want to know that, right? The, and the it, travel agency wants to know whether people on the passenger list are terrorists. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And so does the. Absolutely. Um, so, but but the, the problem, though, one 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 simple and very naive way to solve this problem is we just exchange all the information. We give everybody everything. So so now the plane company also knows the suspect list of the intelligence agency. They probably wouldn't like that much. But and and, and likewise, of course, for privacy reasons, we probably don't want to have uh, the plane company release its 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 passenger list to the intelligence agency. We can't really be sure about that. But my suspicion is that they actually do this right now. Some of them do this, but they don't like it. They don't like it. Yeah. Yet. Okay. So yeah. of, of course it's and it's, we don't like it. It's a, I mean, lots of people don't like it. So 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 the question is, couldn't we somehow figure out what the intersection is of those lists without having to exchange all the information? So is is there a way these two guys can communicate in such a way that we find out exactly what we want to find out, but nothing more than this? So so the so so both sides learn only exactly the names of the terrorists on the passenger list. Yeah. They learn no yes. other terrorists, and they no, learn no longer no other that, passengers. That would be the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems clearly impossible. Well, uh, that's that's what's so fascinating about crypto. Mm -hmm. It's it's full of problems that when you look at it the first time, you you think this cannot possibly be done. Then you think about it again, and you find out yes, it can in fact be done. So, so uh, it. it it does seem, yes, of course it does seem that when you, do, when you want to do computation on something, it must be on the table, it must be accessible, and therefore you must know it, right? But, but it turns out, no, that's not the case. Um, uh, and in the simple way of thinking about it is you can think about in, encrypting the data. So, you know, I, I encrypt my data, you encrypt your data, and it's, it now it's on the table, but it's, it, it can't be seen directly. Only, only the crypto text can be seen. Only, only the, the, the encrypted stuff can be seen. This looks just like gibberish to anyone who, who doesn't know the original data. Um, now, it's imaginable, at least, that you could somehow compute on the crypto text. So, so I have this stuff that contains the passenger list. I have this stuff that, that contains the, the, uh, the terrorist list. Um, and then I can somehow maybe do something on these encryptions. So what comes out is, again, encrypted data. But now this... This encryption contains only the intersection, the, the, the uh, terrorists on the passenger list. Then we can open this up and we will only learn what we opened up. So we, we together decrypt the result of the computation. The computation is done entirely on encrypted data. Yes. The only thing that is ever published is encrypted data. Yeah. And only after the computation do we both decrypt uh, the result of the computation. Yes. And this seems to crucially then involve us, each individual party, being unable to decrypt any of the information. Absolutely. So, so there will have to be some, some, some uh, let's say, sharing of, of key material or, or, or sharing of, of data. So, so the, 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 one of the interesting concepts in, in, in this world is, is something called secret sharing, which is a way in which we can share information so that neither of us know the actual um, information that's involved. Is there some so, kind of toy example where I can convince myself that something like that could be done in principle? Well, for instance, so that, let's say your secret data is, is a number. Five. So, so what's okay, your, I just told them. Five. I, I have, yeah. five is, it's five, is five good, but it's secret. Five is a good yes. example, yes. Yeah. So, so um, what we could now set as a rule is, is I get a number, you get a number, and these two numbers are randomly chosen, such so that their sum is, is five. So this might be, I don't know, um, seven and, and, and minus two. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get seven, you get minus two. Mm -hmm. And the, these being random, what this means is even if your worst enemy finds out, even if my worst enemy finds out that, that you have minus two, so from your point of view, of course, my number could be absolutely anything. And minus two plus whatever can become anything. So just from knowing one of the numbers, you have no idea what, what we're talking about, but together we still have the information. So, so okay, uh, so. So I only know my own number, minus two. You only know your number, seven. Yes. When we meet and agree that we both uh, openly publish our numbers and add them, we get the shared secret five. Yes. That's, that's the idea. So, so this so convinces me that there is information that we own together, but not individually. Right. And, and then the, what is not so obvious, I suppose, but, but what you can actually do technically is, is that when you share information this way, either because we share it in the way we just explained, or because it's encrypted, you can actually operate on this data without looking at the actual clear text, which is, of course, the magic of this thing. But, uh, so there's some math but, involved? But one, there is lots of math involved. Maybe 
if, you, if it sounds mysterious, maybe you can think about it in, in, in the following physical way. Let's say we, we, we make a box which contains a calculator. A calculator. Mm -hmm. A good old-fashioned calculator. Good old-fashioned calculator with, with, with buttons and, and you know, with, uh, for, for, for the digits and, and buttons for, for addition and multiplication and so on, right? And then what, what, what we do is, is, is that, you know, I open, I open the, the box, stick in my hand, and because I know where, where let, let's say, I, I know where the buttons are, mm -hmm. I can key in my, my input data that I want to compute on. You can do the same. We, oh. You stick in your hand, you key in those data, and then... And we, when we hit plus between the two. Then we can hit plus and we can hit times. We can do a computation just by inside. And then once we're done... And we could even agree on the... Com maybe plus and times are outside of the box so we can see what's going sure. to be yeah, yeah. Maybe there's a small hole so I can see the buttons. Mm -hmm. this, right? Or those buttons, right? And then finally, when, once we're done, the result will be on the display. We open the box, look at the display, and we'll see that that was actually the result. So provided that you were honest and I was honest, we now shared basically the, the computation on our shared information. Yeah. Right. So that seems so. So 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 kind of uh, th th there was something called homomorphic encryption, mm -hmm. which is a mathematical tool that operates in pretty much the way this box operates uh, that I was just talking about. So so the, the the box the data being inside the box corresponds to it's encrypted, and 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 this pressing the buttons there uh, corresponds to I can operate on encrypted data without actually look at, looking at what's inside, but I know that things are added and multiplied and so forth. Does this quite convince me that the travel agent and intelligence agency thing works? Because that seems to... Is so this enough in, uh, are these enough concepts for me to, to be convinced that this should be true? Almost. You need one thing more, but we already talked about the secret chain. Because the thing is, every encryption scheme needs a secret key in order to decrypt. Okay? So, so, so opening the box, looking at the result, uh, corresponds to decrypting the data. This requires a certain secret key. Mm -hmm. And what we can do is we can share the information about that secret key by the secret sharing idea we were talking about before. You have something, I have something, and only together will they form what is needed to open the box to, to decrypt the data. So that's what we do at the end. When, when we're done, right? When, when we know that, that the result is on the display of the calculator, then we can use these two shares of the secret key, as we call them, uh, which, so because they together determine the correct secret key, then we can use that to actually open. But of course, only if we both participate. That, that, that's what uh, is your security. I can't open anything on my own. We need to both be agreeing on, on opening this. And, and can, am I allowed to think of the secret key as, actu as a figurative actual key, which I just cut into, so individually none of these two keys does anything? That's pretty and, and And then there is some math which probably exists, yes. which behaves yeah. exactly like this. Yeah. In a simpler case, it would just be addition of numbers. It's not quite like this in real life, but you know, the, the, the example is good enough. So, so let me take one step back and t talk a bit about I guess disciplines or epistemology here. So we mentioned math several times, we also mentioned the real life. So normally when we try to solve problems by inventing new ideas and new tools, our, our um, scientific approach or epistemology is to test it. Right? So, so I have some kind of new idea for a plane or a car or anything, anything like that, and I normally demonstrate to the outside world that this works by simply seeing, yeah, my car drives, I mean, it, it works, or my, my, my ship doesn't sink. Why? And none of these are mathematical disciplines, right? All of these are engineering disciplines or use the good old-fashioned scientific method in the sense that perform an experiment and possibly falsify your hypothesis and, and otherwise go back to the drawing board. Why are we, doing, why are we using mathematics for this? Well, because, because the only... Uh, first of all, in order to construct these special encryption schemes and secret sharing and whatnot, to have any hope that they work, we need math. We, we need, we need uh, concepts from math to do this. Um, and secondly, because if I want to demonstrate in a technically sound fashion that my construction works, that this, uh, my, my implementation of the magic box with the calculator actually works, is a mathematical theorem which, which I'll have to prove. But why does it have to be that? Why, why can't it just be, uh, here it is, try to break it, it didn't break, so that must oh, be good so, enough. So, so um, um, actually, I would say that for some of our constructions, it's actually much better than, than, than having uh, something put out there, see if you can break it. 
because for, for the best of our constructions, we can actually prove that you cannot do it. It's simply a mathematical right. provable fact. I, I guess this is what I wanted to do, right? And, 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 and the mathematical proof speaks with a completely different form of brutality than the absence of a falsifying experiment, right? The, 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 the fact that I invented a crypto system which nobody so far broke may simply be an artifact that nobody really tried, or, or those people who did try to break it didn't have the uh, honesty to tell me about it. Sure. So they are not incentivized to tell me that my crypto system sucks. Therefore, in this particular field of engineering, we actually need mathematical proofs that, that say that breaking this crypto system is a mathematical impossibility. Yes, so, so, so th there are two flavors here. So some of our constructions, we can actually prove uh, rigorously that, that there's nothing you can do uh, to break it. In other cases, we can do the next best thing, namely that, that well, think about it this way. So you, you invent this crypto system and, and you hope nobody can break it. And, and you put it out there, nobody did it so far, but as you say, I mean, who, who knows whether you just overlooked some error, who knows whether somebody found the error but just didn't tell you, etc. So, so how can we have better assurance that, that you know, you have not, you know, uh, uh, tried to fool us all or something, or fool yourself even. Um, so, so what we do there is we take some, some well-studied problem, some, some computational problem that, that, that lots of people ever since, uh, say in the case of factorization, for instance, is, is one of these prominent problems, um, where you're trying to break a number into its prime factors. Oh, but uh, that's easy, right? 21 is broken into, what, 7 times 3, so that was Oh, sure, yes, no problem. Easy? Well, no, not always, because when the numbers get larger, it, it gets too hard. So the but I have computers, right? They can just try, I mean, factorization is a trivial problem, right? It's, I, I just try, does 2 divided? No. Does 3 divided? No. Absolutely. 5, 7, So the problem so is that, that uh, when the numbers get really big, this, this approach gets, gets completely infeasible. As an example, if you, if you take, so let, let's take um, a thousand bit number, for instance. Which, which corresponds to, I don't know, 600, 800 digits in, in, in decimal notation. So it's a really big thing. And let's say this thing is a product of two primes of, of the same size. So, so what you're looking for is, is, is roughly a 500-bit prime. If the product was 2,000, you multiply two 500-bit numbers, you get 1,000 bits. So, so if, you, if you do what you just said, oh, was it two? No. Was it three? No. Was it five? No. Just go on like this. You'll be, you'll be uh, working for, for, for the, at least more than the age of the known universe before you're done. But so, that's just because I'm a human, right? I now let a computer do it. Uh, take the fastest computer that, that's known. You'll still be working for more than the age of the universe. There's just too, there's just too many primes that, uh, involved. There's too many possibilities. So, so what we call exhaustive search, which is what this is, is just not feasible if you make the problem big enough. Okay, then you can ask, of course, couldn't somebody find a faster way? Right. And that this, this, uh, here we don't know ex exactly the answer. We have known, we know that mathematicians ever since the days of Gauss, uh, who was you know, a famous German mathematician, uh, lived many hundred years ago, have thought about this problem and tried to find better solutions. They have gone slightly better, but not much. So, so if we believe that, um, if we can now mathematically prove that to break my construction, you'll have to factor a very large number, then, you know, uh, you don't have to, have to believe that I was thinking in the right way. Uh, if you have to break it, you have to do better than all these important and very brainy guys that ever lived ever since 1600 and up, up to 2017, which is, of course, not a proof, but, but better than just relying on my in ingenuity, of course. Yeah, and all these people were strongly incentivized to publish their result if, I w if they would have found it. Right? Yes, sure. there, there's, Gauss would not have kept this a secret if he had been able to do this. And uh, so, so this is, I think, one of the big conceptual breakthroughs of, of computer science that you can use the absence of a solution. So basically we are basing... What, what blows my mind here is that, that the security of the Internet, the fact that the Internet works, is based on our inability to solve certain computational problems. I, I think this is mind-blowing, that, that, that our, our common assumption that certain problems are very, very hard and not uh, uh, computationally feasible, that this computational hardness assumption gives us something that builds stuff, that we can use an, an, an agreement on, on collective stupidity to, 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 produce, well, yeah. to, to produce functionality. Yeah. You, you could put it that way, but, but it, it's also, I mean, if, if you go to the physical world, it, it's, it's not a totally unknown concept. I mean, you, you and I, we are both 
uh, old enough to, to remember the, these, these old bike locks that they used to be with little taps that you had to push in or pull out yeah. to, to open the lock, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you can ask yourself, can, can you steal such a bike, bike without using violence if it's locked? And the answer is, of course you can. Just try all combinations until you're done, right? Um, so the question is then, why do you lock your bike? Well, because it takes time to try out multiple combinations. And, and because that time is, you know, in some sense reasonable in connection with the value of a bike, so to speak. Right? So, oh, that's a very nice example. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, we do the same on the Internet. We, we, we hide our secrets behind uh, problems that are too hard to solve in practice. It takes so long time that we think that's fine. Um, uh, because you have to try all these possibilities, but in, in, in a way it's the same as well. And if the information is more important to you, then you just buy a larger lock. Which you would have to buy a larger lock. And that means that whenever you want to use your bike, it takes slightly more time. It does indeed. Uh, oh, that was a great example. So we are already used to, from the physical world to use the absence of the solution of certain... to use the uh, unbearable slowness of brute force. Yeah in order to actually achieve something that we couldn't achieve before, yes. namely have your bike secure. So of course it's, it's uh, now it goes even, maybe if I push it a bit, goes oh, even a little do, bit further. Do. Because, because of course, when you lock your bike this way, you also rely on the assumption that nobody comes up with, with a clever little special piece of tool. He can just stick in the lock and it just goes open immediately. Uh, but this clever piece of tool would be a breakthrough itself, right? That would it be would, great for society. It, yeah. it, it would in yeah. some sense, yeah. So, and then so you would need to invent, yeah. then sure. you would need to invent uh, another lock, a bike lock. Exactly. I guess this gives me an elegant segue to talk about quantum computation, right? Because so, so um, if and when, whenever I give a popular science talk to the public, this is a question I get that, that how far are we with, with quantum computers? And once quantum computers work, which is, which is always just three years away, uh, it's e either just before or just after general artificial intelligence. So, so whenever quantum computers will finally be made to work, then all crypto systems are broken, and no. then we are dead? No, no, no. no. So, 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 I mean, uh, there, is, there is some truth to what you're saying, that, that, that what we know is that if we could build a large enough quantum computer, uh, it would be able to break all the cryptography, well, okay, all the so-called public key cryptography that we use on the internet today. And, and so, so, so if this really happened overnight, then, then the internet would, would, would be seriously, security on the internet would, would, be, would be gone. By virtue of the fact that we just happen to have based a lot of security on the same computational hardness assumption. Yes, or well, actually a couple of hardness assumptions, but they can all be broken with a quantum computer, it turns out. And just to update me on that, so that is factoring because there is a yes. very nice factoring algorithm due to yes. Shor? Uh, Shor, yes, P P yeah. Peter Shor from MIT. And, and, and also th there's another problem that we call discrete logarithm problem, uh, which interestingly, by almost the same algorithm, yeah. can also be solved on the quantum computer. Um, so, and, and there's a whole family of problems with, with you know, nice uh, algebraic properties that, that, that fall un under the same hat here, so they, they can all be solved. Uh, using enough, um, using, using a large enough. Right. So, so there's a certain group of computationally hard problem. Computationally hard in the sense that a classical computer, uh, we don't know much cleverer things than brute force, mm -hmm. but a quantum computer has access to a certain computational, uh, what primitive mm -hmm. that is not available to, yeah. to a classical computer. This primitive is based on a collapse of the wave function. I'm on thin ice here, yeah. but, but, but it, it, it's, it's some kind of, if you want, very parallel operation that you can do very quickly. There, there, there are several you know, notions inside here, yeah. but, but, but of course, yeah. the, the, it's true that, that as far as we know, quantum computers do totally outperform classical computers on certain problems. On certain problems. If, 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 if they were big enough. And these problems are exactly the problems that we chose to make the internet secure. Some of them, yes. Some of yeah. them, yes. 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 Um, but, but, but the interesting thing is, is it's, it's not all broken at all, in fact. And, and, and it, there's still very, very good reason to believe that even if you have a quantum computer of any size that you like, I, I can still efficiently generate a problem for you to solve that you would have a hard time solving. Even with a quantum computer. Even with a quantum computer. Because I guess this is one of the misunderstandings we need out of the way. Even a quantum computer cannot, as far as we know, solve any of the famously hard problems in computational complexity? Sure. So, so all of these so-called NP-complete problems or NP-hard problems, 
that, that, that we know a bunch of and we, which, which are famous for being the hardest problems that, 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 that we know of and that are practical relevance, let's put it this way. Um, these problems, as far as we know, and we have good reason to believe it's the case, that they cannot be solved efficiently on a quantum computer. Yeah. A quantum computer is not a magical machine that solves all hard problems for us. Not at all. It just solves two specific yeah. hard problems for us, yeah. and a lot, of, a lot of crypto is based on in, this. In, in fact, a classical computer can do everything a quantum computer can do. Just much slower. It's just much slower. Yeah. So, so, uh, so therefore, I mean, th the news is good in the sense that, that, that we also have concrete candidate crypto systems we could use on the internet that as far as we know would not be breakable by a quantum computer. Right, so if I tomorrow announce that I did actually build a quantum computer uh, of a sufficient size, then there will just be a, a very hectic time on the internet where everybody recomputes a lot of crypto. It will be ex crypto. extremely hectic. It will be extremely hectic. Because yes. from experience we know that, that um, even when things have been broken, like certain hash functions have been broken for instance, it takes a very long time before that code that implements those wrong functions are gone from practice. They, 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 there is an enormous latency here. So, so if, if overnight all the public key crypto got broken in this way, that, that, that would be a major catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, uh, do we have some good anecdotes here? So, so for instance, the SHA-1 uh, uh, hash function, which is based again on the Damgor yeah. Merkel construction. Yeah. Merkel is not the German chancellor. It's another Merkel, yes. also spelled slightly differently. Yes, yes. that's true. Yes. Uh, uh, so that was famously, there was a so-called collision, which we can just translate as this was broken, what yeah. is this, five years ago, no, ten years ago? It's ten, twi 2005? Oh, so, 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 so there, there, there are several functions involved here. So, so, so um, one of the things that, that got terribly badly broken is, is something called MD5, MD for message digest, number five, that was the fifth version of that function, um, which was used in practice for, for a long time and which was totally broken in the sense that, that um, um, there was a company that, that even, the, even when they were told about the fact that the function was broken, they, they insisted on using it because they didn't believe that it had any practical consequence. That, that you know, the, these mathematicians, what do they know? And they, they can't really you know, do anything. So um, some scientists set out to prove that they were wrong. So they, they, they actually made uh, a system using a bunch of PlayStation 2 <laughs> machines. This must be in the olden days, the yes. PlayStation 2, yes. yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and, and what, so what they did was that, that they, um, they did a system that, that, that could forge so-called certificates that were issued by this company. So a certificate is your digital ID card, so to speak. This is what, what you use when you update your software on your, on your sure. yeah, phone yeah. or on your yeah. home all, computer. All the new software yeah. update comes with a certificate. That certificate yeah. is signed by this so-called hash function, yeah, yeah. which should increase your belief that the sender of the message is actually yeah, so the, the software the, company. Yeah, so the, 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 there is hashing and then there is signature afterwards. But never mind, I mean, if, if you can break the hash function, you can actually forge, if you can break it badly enough, you, you can actually forge these certificates. So I, I, can now, I can now become someone I'm not and stuff like this. And and they for instance, uh, somebody who is not Microsoft could say they're Microsoft and sure. ask you to update your uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. operating system and then... So, and, and, and so they demonstrated this to the company and then they changed the function, <laughs> finally. So it, it, it just shows that, that, that there's unfortunately a big difference these days between practice of security and theory of security in some cases that it, it's sometimes very hard for people in practice who have all these expenses and, and, and terrible problems with practical problems with changing to a different function, uh, different constructions, that to, they, have, they don't really want to believe that something is broken when it is. Well, they probably paid good money for somebody else to certify that the system is secure and so this is even just from the from a management point of view it's probably difficult for an organization to to change their security routines this particularly plus if they paid for it there's a, <laughs> they, that's true that there's also a cultural issue here that that um, people have a bad habit of not designing security software with flexibility so you can easily change to another primitive if, if the set function is broken i'll just use a better one uh, things are too often hardwired into the code so now it becomes uh, a major, uh, and, and it's, it's hardwired into the code. The guy who wrote the code is now in another company. You can't get hold of this guy, and now you have a terrible problem in updating your software. Or something that is very expensive. Yes. So you are not going to do anything about this until it's really, really yes. problematic, because you need to, even, even if you're the one person in the company who thinks this is serious, it's still very difficult to convince the rest that something has to change. This plus the fact that, I mean, of, of course, there's also the, the incentives uh, can be more complicated because maybe, maybe uh, 
your software as part is to blame for something wrong happened, but maybe you don't suffer the consequences so much as the guys who use it. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's another problem, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah, so I guess that's, we, we should maybe branch into that intersection then between theory and industry, because not, so not only do you prove theorems about these things, you also have a company that, that tries to transport these solutions into the, in, into the real world. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's an interesting story because um, in, so the, back to the, the, this multi-party computation technology we were talking about before, the, the implementing the magic box where computations go on in secret inside. Um, and so we're, we're quite proud because in, in Denmark uh, we, we did the first industrial prototype of this thing. So so the uh, not even prototype, but actually real application in, in industry application of, of, of this thing. Um, of multi-party, multi secure multi-party yes. computation. It happened back in, in, in 2009. Uh, and the story is quite interesting, actually, because um, it, it sort of speaks about, I guess, I guess, when these things are applicable and when they're not. So, so what happened was that um, in Denmark, we, we have a big production of, of, of sugar beets. Uh, and um, it used to be the case that, that this, uh, the farmers who, who grew these things uh, received a very large amount of support from the EU. In fact, so much that it paid off to do this, even if you're not very good at growing them, or even if your soil was not fit for this thing, really. The sugar beets were no longer the, the value-generating thing, but the uh, subsidies were? Pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, all of a sudden, the EU announced that they were going to reduce the sugar beet production support with 40%. Mm -hmm. And now there was somewhat of a panic going on because this, this meant of course that if the production was supposed to survive in Denmark you would have to move very quickly the production to another place to places where it paid off actually um, so what happens is, is that if you're a farmer you have a contract that gives you the right to to you know produce a number of tons of sugar beet or another product and and and, and get you know a certain amount in support for this these contracts can be bought and sold between farmers um, and this, this, this was already allowed, you could do this, but, but, but what, what they used to be doing was just, you know, call the, f call the neighbor on the phone and see if he would give you a good price. Mm -hmm. But of course, this, this would not suffice anymore if you have to move nationwide the production to a different, you need a nationwide marketplace for these things. Uh -huh. And this was not there. Interesting. Um, so, so establishing something like this, like an auction for these things, or, or exchange, is not so trivial because, um, um, who should play the auction house? So the one that collects all the bits and, and see who trades with who. Um, you might think, well, what, what about uh, the company that produces sugar? So they, they, this was called Danisco back then, now they're called Nordic Sugar. Uh, but, but the thing is, the farmers weren't too happy about Danisco centralizing this market because uh, they, had, they have monopoly on the Danish market for sugar beet production. So they're also the ones you have to, you know, um, negotiate prices with next year. So if I give them my bid in, in the auction, they will know about my economic situation. That's, that, that's not really good. So the thing is, when you have such as an auction, f the people who bid will typically think of the bids as private information. Um, uh, because it, 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 it contains things like if I want to buy something, if the price per ton is this much, I want to buy so much. If the price is high, I probably want to buy less. Etc. So I get this decreasing series of numbers, and 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 this this gives information away about my economic situation. So that, that's not something you, you are want. now the farmer, right? I now, now yeah. I'm the farmer, yeah. So so if I'm a farmer, I'm I, I don't want my bids to be to be public. I want them to be private. But you still want to announce them because you want to win the. I still want uh, to figure out who wins the auction, right? Yeah. So th this is a typical multi-party computation problem. You get in secret bids, you compute on these guys on uh, the bids uh, in private on the encryption, so to speak. And you figure out in the end who wins the auction and, and, and what, and what oh, do they Oh, okay. this is really a good example then. Okay, so we have a bunch of farmers. Are these hundreds or tens yeah. or...? Uh, in the first instance of the auction, we had about 1,500. Uh, okay, 1,500 yeah. farmers. And the, and, and the computation is actually just finding the maximum of a bunch of numbers? Well, well actually, it's, it's, it's the it's, data function. It's somewhat more complicated than it's, this. It's more complicated. I don't know if we should tell that story, but, but, but basically what happens is given the supply and the demand in the market, you want to find the so-called market clearing price, which is a well-defined notion in economics, which is the price per ton that people should trade at. Yes. So the idea is, uh, for each possible price per ton that might come out, you figure out how much is on sale in the market for this price and how much is in demand, and you find the price where, where, where supply meets demand. 
That's the market clearing price, and then people people know what to, what to buy and sell for. And that's, 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 that's really the thing you want to compute. But each here. individual farmer is not incentivized to publish uh, his or her complete no. economic profile yeah. for uh, how much is this particular amount of sugar beets worth to me. Yes, exactly. And, and, and the, the thing is that, so we actually tried to confirm this after the auction was gone, what, what, what was, was done. Uh, we asked the farmers in, in, in the survey whether they thought that, that privacy of their bids was important to them. And, and 70 something percent said that, that it was really important or important to them, that it was kept secret. Okay, so just to, to okay, now the, the, the story is already over. So, so you, you, you wrote the system. Okay, so what happened was, was the yes, following, yes. that, 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 that um, the system that was built was a system where farmers could use their own PC at home uh, to, to um, we, we sent them software in the browser that they could use to encrypt their bits. Um, and this was then sent in, uh, it was collected, all encrypted form, of course. Um, and the key that could open all this stuff was shared between three parties. And the three parties were the farmers' organization, the Nisco, the sugar company, and, and us as, as neutral third party. You, your, the, your the, company. The university, the university. Oh, your university. At, at first. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once all these bits comes in, then we do this multi-party, three-party computation actually between these three parties to figure out what the market clearing price would be. Uh, and then we could, from the bits, we could also figure out who gets to buy and who gets to sell and how much. So, so that, that was the, how the auction works. So you uh, found the right answer, nobody revealed more information than they should have, yeah. and moreover you also tell me that they actually believed this. There's this trust issue which I've talked with several guests on this podcast yeah. already now. It's not only a question of yes. finding the right answer, finding the right answer without anybody uh, uh, revealing too much information, yes. but in addition you want people to actually trust that everything worked out correctly. Sure, so I think... Um the, the biggest worry that people had, the, the ones we talked to during the, during the process, the biggest worry they had, will it work, will we get a result at all? Or will it crash or something? And if we get a result, will it be the correct result? That was yeah. the biggest worry. Because, because so figuratively, you have this black box, every farmer puts in his hand into a black box, types numbers on the keypad, leaves again, mm -hmm. then three people come in with their shared key, open the box and the number says, 15,000 whatever. Per a ton or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a number. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And then everybody has to believe that to it, it was the right thing. Okay. Yeah, so of course, what, what, um, so one, one way in which you can check this, of course, is that slightly more than, than, than the actual market prices revealed, because we also have to figure out if, if, if you're a farmer that, that bid, um, we, we make public how much did you want to sell, if you wanted to sell, how much did you want to sell at that price? Yeah. Because you actually get to sell that much. Yeah. And of course, you can check this afterwards, but this will be what you meant. Right? So, so there, there's some self-control to some extent in the system. But anyway, it, it's, um, it was an interesting uh, application. We, we, we formed a spin-off company, sort of, you know, we were so happy about this, this actually working, that, that we thought this must be applicable in other contexts as well. Um, so there, there's this company called Patricia that, that works with this still. Um, and it does many things, but it has also, it has, it has also run the sugar beet auction uh, once a year, I think most years since then. Actually. Well, this is, uh, so you really got your hands dirty in the sense that this is actually about sugar beets, it's about farming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. of Fantastic. course, I mean, it's, it's, it didn't have to be, it could be any agricultural it product. Be, or it could actually but, be but, any auction, I guess. But, but I think, why sugar beets? The answer is, I think, that they did not have this, this nationwide market before. And we could give this to them. And on top, we could tell the farmers that, by the way, once your bid leaves your PC, it's encrypted, and we never decrypt the thing. Yes. And, and, and so in, in that sense, it's, a, it's an enabler. Are people willing to establish a nationwide market? Yes, if we can guarantee them privacy of their bids, it's all fine. So, so I, I think the, the best future for this technology will be in other cases like this, where we don't have a solution currently because people don't want to give away their data, but we can, we can create a situation where it's fine to do so. Right, because so, so the insight is here that there are lots of things we could do uh, computationally, lots of problems we could solve, uh, but we, we don't want to do this for reasons of privacy. So individual players don't want to release their data. And I guess we can talk about sugar beets just as much as we can talk about the healthcare system, for instance. Sure, we, and we can also talk about something else which we've been doing a little bit also uh, in practice, uh, which is uh, so-called benchmarking. So buzzword and modern, modern management, right? So, so the idea is that, that if, if you are a company in a certain line of business, what, what they typically worry about is how well are we doing 
compared to other companies in the same line of business. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, so so given my, my numbers for productivity, how much do people get in salary, blah, blah, blah. Um, if I knew those numbers for other companies, I could compare myself to them and see, by the way, they're doing much better than me in this respect, all of them. I must be able to improve too. And, and there are economists who study this and, and have very good analysis methods that, that if, if they're given all this data, they, they, they will tell every company, that's the direction you should go in. Um, this is a service that everybody wants, but nobody wants to give input data to it because, of course, the problem is the guys you compare yourself with are also the competitors because they're in the same line of business. Um, so what do people do in practice? Well, what they do sometimes is that they hire a consultancy company um, who are willing to stake their good name and reputation on not selling these data. They promise that you yeah, and they analyze your firm, but they're not going to tell what yeah. the outcome is. And they're paid a huge fee for this, of course. Um, and every time they have to do analysis, you pay them another huge fee. Um, in part, one could, if, if, if you're unkind, you could describe this as a kind of counter bribe. A counter bribe. That, you know, oh, that's that, right. That's nice. That, that's that today's are, word. Yes. They're, they're, they're being paid enough that it wouldn't pay off for them to actually misuse yes. the data. Uh, I'm sure they wouldn't describe <laughs> themselves uh, this in, in, the, in this way, and it, it's probably also not quite fair, but still, you know, th there's a reason why this is an is, is expensive service, right? Yes. So what, what you can say is if instead you would do this using multi-party conversation via a software system, that would just take all the data in an encrypted form, do the analysis, deliver, you know, comparisons to every company individually, um, you would just have to pay for development of that software system once and amortize the cost over this over tons of applications every year. And, and so, I mean, th th this makes sense from a really practical point of view, to me at least. Um, so we, we've been doing experiments with this in the financial sector, where the idea is to compare, um, it's a different kind of benchmarking, where you're comparing a, a potential customer who wants a loan to different banks' um, customer databases. So you can score people. This is what banks usually do, that, that mm -hmm. when you apply for a loan, that, that you, you, you are, you, your data is scored against their database, mm -hmm. so they can see how likely you are to default uh, at some point. Um, and, and some banks would like a bigger database to compare against, but of course this is not good if the database is, 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 in another, is, is inside another bank. Um, yeah. But, mm -hmm. but if you can combine different databases in a secure way, then, then everybody is, is happier potentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, this is where it's at right now, secure multi-party computation? So it's, it, it's kind of, we're at the point where people are finally starting, also ordinary people out there, are finally starting to realize, some of them, what this technology can do, actually. What, what does it mean? Um, and it, this is a highly non-trivial fact because, it, 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 it's, as you said, this sounds like it's impossible. So, you know, this, this, this is the first reaction. Then after you accept it might be possible, then, then what can it actually do for you? It, 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 it's a complicated beast, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not clear that people just understand this just like this, right? Um, so it takes time. Uh, and, and the concept itself dates from the late 80s. Um, so, um, and, and only now, I, I, I saw the other day that, that there's um, uh, a consulting company that, that has sort of a, a chart where they, where they put different uh, buzzwords in IT, like, like uh, blockchain and all that sort of stuff, um, on a curve. So, so on the right of the curve, you have more and more hype, and then the hype is maximal at some point. Then it starts falling off again because people realize that all those promises could not really be, be, be satisfied after all. And then you land on some realistic level at some point. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they actually had, had multi-party competition on the upslope of the curve now. Okay, so, so from uh, now it's downwards. Yes, for well, a while. It's, it's, it's not at the top. It's, it's not at the top, top yet. Yes. Okay. So maybe there will be enormous hype at some point. Okay. That, you know, but who knows? Because, so what, what could be, so don't, would this solve many of our privacy issues with, for, I mean, so as an individual citizen, our problem is that all my data is now, certainly in Scandinavia, available to lots of individual state agents. My, uh, my health history, for instance, and my income history and my mortgage and so on is, is available to very few uh, highly monopolized players who, if they wanted to, could just combine all this data and, and, and it's not clear that this is a good direction to go in. Yep. So, so, so that sort of thing can be solved, um, in principle at least, um, with this technology. Because what you, so if, if somebody wants to, 
you know, extract stuff from all these databases, maybe for, for a good purpose, that is, maybe for research or something else. Oh, could be then, a brilliant uh, purpose. I mean, the, 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 the ultimate goal of this, curing cancer, would be great, but it's still not good that the security, that the, that the insurance, uh, I don't want the insurance company to yeah. know my health history anyway. Of course. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so what you don't want to do is to give a single entity access to everything here. Uh, but you do want to extract the data and it depends that what you want to extract actually depends on all these different databases And this is exactly what multi-party computation can do for you that it, you can you make sure to get the right research result coming out But but you don't uh, have to actually collect all the data in one place um, I should say um, what a caution here because um, The history of the field is back in the 80s when it was just basic research Everybody was saying I was saying too that, that uh, this is all very nice in theory but it will never fly in practice. It's way too slow. Um, and it was this way. Uh, there, was a, there was a very silent area in, in the 90s. And then all of a sudden, you know, people got ideas uh, from 2000 and on. And, and one thing led to another. And we had improvements of many orders of magnitude. So, so thousandfold improvement in speed of these things. So now all of a sudden it starts being applicable to real world problems. So, 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 so based on what? Is there some brief explanation of why this has become faster? Um, which is not only that hardware has become faster? No, no it's, 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 it's very much algorithmic things going on here. Um, and I think, I think it's, it's, it's very hard to point out one idea. It's a whole jungle of ideas that, that, that kept coming up. Uh, and one, one thing leads to another. So, uh, so you used algorithmic here, and that's one of the pet peeves of mine. So this is, this is really algorithmic in the narrow sense, right? This uses new ideas. This is not just yeah, yeah. Uh, harvesting big data and machine learning this some is, kind of happen. Yeah. Instead, sure. somebody has had a new idea here, yeah. which is just sort of a, yeah. a conceptual intellectual breakthrough. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a new algorithm yeah. here. Yeah. It's not just so this, big uh, data. Yeah. Sure. So the, 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 this revolution, I, I would call it, in, in the field from 2005 onwards, uh, that was what led to, to us doing this industrial uh, application at first in 2009. That, that was the first ever thing. Uh, and then things just, you know, uh, um, you have a whole, a whole explosion of things going on now. Um, so, so, of course, the, the issue here is that when you do things on the seal of encryption, or when you can only do things by communicating, which is also necessary sometimes, of course, this will slow down things compared to if you just had every data centralized, all the data centralized on one machine. So there is a price for security. And for privacy and so on. And the question I, is I, what the price is. It's become much smaller, but there's still a price. So, so sort of to illustrate, um, uh, the speed at which we can do the secure computation these days, in the best case, is kind of comparable to the speed of, of, of the old Intel 83, 83 processors that we had in, back in the 90s. So what, what, what pieces were using back then? So we are what, one generation behind, one yeah. half generation yeah. behind, but yeah. now we can make, do our computation secure. And just to spell this out, secure does not mean that the answer is more correct. Secure is that we're not leaking information that the individual parties were not willing yes. to leak. So the, the, uh, the concept here is that it's a way to make sure that you know exactly what you're giving away and nothing more than this. People sometimes, uh, some common misconception is when you do secure computation, it means you keep everything secret. Of course you don't, there's a certain result you do want to compute and this of course becomes known to some people. But it's a way to, to design, it's this exact thing I want to release and nothing more. You release the information, theoretically minimal amount of information needed to get the right answer? Or is oh, this it's, too it's, specific now? No, it, it's, uh, I would rather say you release the answer. So you release so the answer, yes. It, 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 and and, and what, the, what the construction guarantees you is that that answer that, that you wanted to compute is the only information that gets released about your inputs. Right, and if you don't want the answer, then of course you can't play, but if you're actually interested sure. in the answer, then this is the minimal amount of information you need to leak, yeah. mm -hmm. and the system guarantees, provided you did your math right, yeah. that it does exactly this. Yeah. yeah. Right. So this is now many steps removed from from the from the folk understanding of cryptography, yes. which is just secret writing, what Caesar used mm -hmm. to communicate with yeah. his troops. Yeah. So there's at, at least one step in the middle, or maybe even two, that I also just like to to get you briefly to explain, and that is uh, authentication or uh, signatures. Mm -hmm. I guess we talked a bit about hash functions already, but yeah. as a, as a concept, I think this is another surprise that that the same technology that allows you to communicate secretly, that is nobody else can yeah. listen to what you say, yeah. also allows you to prove that you are who you, who you claim yes. you are. Yes, and, and that, that, that's of course, if you think about it, 
an internet application, of course, authentication should actually be thought of also as a necessary ingredient for secrecy. Because if I don't know who I'm talking to, then who learns what I'm sending? You have no idea. So, 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 so in order to have some, some idea about, who you, uh, about what happens to my information, you better know who you're talking to. Or who the yeah. author of the information was. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, so, so basically. I okay. Mean, the, fine. The, but this yeah. still sounds as if it's two opposite problems, as, as if yeah. these two things are completely orthogonal and have nothing to do yeah. with each other. So, so in a certain sense, qualitatively, in terms of what you're trying to achieve, they are opposite because because in in old-fashioned cryptography, you're trying to keep things secret. You want to send stuff from A to B in such a way that no third party can see what you're sending. Whereas in the authentication, you still want to send information from A to B, but it's not secret at all. You just want to make sure that nobody on the way can manipulate the data without this being visible when, when it arrives. Right, it's the opposite of secret, right? It's very unsecret and it's provably actually sent by the person who claims yeah, so that when, when, it. So when, when I receive something, supposedly from you, I can verify that this was really what you want to say just now. In a certain or, sense. or more dramatically, it's not just email between me and you, but it's a software update for some safety critical yes. system. Yeah. Absolutely. Your pacemaker or yeah, yeah. whatever it is. Hmm? So, by, um, I don't know if, if you want to call this coincidence or whatever, but, but, but it turns out that, that the same underlying mathematical tools can be used for both. Mm -hmm. um, um, there are exceptions. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, hash functions, it turns out. Now, now it gets a bit, you know, specialized, I guess. Oh, but, that's but, great. But, but, we but will hash, play music later. So, let's take hash functions now and then we will end with some okay. music so, to so, balance it out. Uh, so, hash functions is, is, is one of these mathematical tools that, that, that is used in, in both authentication and also for secrecy to some extent. Um, but, but hash functions by themselves cannot be used, if that's the only tool you have. You cannot use them for secrecy, really. Uh, for, for public key cryptography, for instance, the, which is what you need for the internet. It's a special form of cryptography that's called public key crypto. This you cannot build using hash functions as far as we know. But signatures, digital signatures, so where I, I, I sign something digitally, you know it's from me, this can be done using just hash functions. Strangely enough. So I guess then you need, you now forced yourself to explain what a hash function is. So a hash function is, is, uh, is something, is, is um, a tool which takes as input a possibly very long message, any length of message that you want, and produces a short digest, if you will, a short fingerprint of the message. So even if the message was several megabytes long, the output is just 256 bits, for instance. Could I just add up all the characters and divide by... Uh, I take every 20th character. Yeah, so no, this does not work. So, so uh, what you want to achieve is that somehow... Um, knowing that the, the, the output, the, the digest, must depend in some complicated way on all parts of the message. Because what you want to achieve is that if you believe that the hash function, is this, this digest comes from me, you, this, this is as convincing as believing that the message that was input comes from me. So in other words, it must be hard to, to uh, if you're sure that the hash function, is, that the hash function value uh, is genuine, then the reason why you can be sure that then the message is also genuine is because nobody can find a different message that has the same digest. So, but that's a very specific kind of hash function, a hash function that yeah. is sort of hard to invert or... Yeah, yeah. Hmm? so, so it's, it, it's some complicated mathematical beast that somehow ensures you that, that if you want to authenticate that this long message comes from me, you can actually compress it to something really small and you just have to be convinced that this thing comes from me, that the smaller thing. I see, okay. So it just replaces a large problem with a shorter one and then then I need some extra black box to convince myself that the shorter message was from you. Yeah, however, the surprise here is that this extra thing can also be built from hash functions. This is a much longer story. Ah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and actually, th this is one of the surprising exceptions from the rule that, that you were talking about before. Everything you, you, that, that you know, is, is used for authentication is also used for, for signatures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry, everything that's used for, for secrecy is also used for authentication. But there, 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 there are examples where one thing really only lives in one world. Hmm. But, but I, I, it's still a continuous surprise to me that a lot of the things that make the interest, that make the inter internet more than just YouTube, namely that make the internet useful for banking, for buying stuff, or for, bu for selling uh, sugar beets, uh, are based on the same, on the same 
history of secret writing, right? which is a thousand-year-old idea. Yes. I think so, this is a, yeah, yeah. There's no reason for why it should have been that. I guess not, but uh, yeah. So we already mentioned quantum once. I have to mention quantum again here because there's also a way to use quantum not to break crypto systems but to build crypto systems. That's quantum, quantum, quantum encryption, which is something quantum. completely different than quantum computation. Absolutely, yes, totally. So explain. Well, so 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 the thing is that um, uh, when we communicate unusual uh, internet technology, often with with, with, with uh, you know optical fibers. What happens there is, is the light travels through the fiber and you have myriads of photons, you know, that, that light is made out of, of photons, right? And they, they, they together carry the signal. Um, so the so, um, property of this implementation, of course, is that as an adversary, I could steal a little part of that signal. Nobody would probably notice. I, I can kind of copy what I see uh, and, and in this way listen to what is being sent. Maybe what is being sent is encrypted. I might, I might be able to understand it. But it's clear that physically, you know, whenever something comes past, past me, I can take a copy and write it down. And, and when, when the guy receives it, he will not know that it was copied by someone else. There, there's no way to tell. This would true, be true of, of standard pieces of paper as well. Sure. It's not important that this was photons. Yeah, in a, yeah. so, so of decay. course, I'm, I'm going somewhere with the example. But, mm -hmm. but so, so, so the idea now is, now imagine that we instead would communicate by sending one photon at a time. So each photon carries a little bit, bit of information with it, and okay. which can be read on, on the okay. other side. Yeah. Okay, the new thing is now it, you cannot, this, this idea of undetected eavesdropping doesn't exist anymore. You cannot steal half a photon, that does not exist. For reasons of quantum mechanics, because yeah. I can't, because I, so, if I remember uh, my, the, the, my... The, the least entity of light that exists is a photon. So either the adversary lets it pass by, the guy who wants to do the eavesdropping, he can let the photon pass by, in which case he didn't learn anything. He can try to eavesdrop on the communication by taking the photon, doing something to it, reading what it has uh, brought with it, and, and then sending it on. But this changes the state of the photon? Quantum mechanics is, is put together in such a way that it, what it claims is that you cannot measure something without having a possibility of affecting what you measure. So what this means is that when the thing was eavesdropped, it's no longer the same signal anymore. And therefore, you actually have a chance of detecting. Uh, if so, so you know, two honest parties talk to each other. You actually have physically now a chance of detecting whether you eavesdropped or not. Oh, so the eavesdropper actually gets the information, but Alice and Bob know that they have been eavesdropped upon because yes. the signal has been changed. Yes. And, and so, so, so here, the here the security of the communication is based on uh, quantum mechanics being correct yes. instead of certain properties of discrete logarithms right. or primes. Yes. Yeah. Because you, if, if you believe Heisenberg and Einstein, and these guys, they, they not Einstein actually, but <laughs> he was against quantum mechanics, but, but Heisen, Heisenberg and these guys, um, that, that um, if you believe them, then, then there's, you simply cannot measure this thing without pushing it a little bit, so they will, it, it will change the state. Um, and, and so... Um, and this actually uh, works. This actually does they, they, work. They can build this. It's been implemented. And, and so, of course, you might say, but wait a minute, is, is this good enough? Because the adversary might actually, actually learn some of your information, right? So if you send all your, all your best secrets this way, isn't it too late? I mean, the guy is already in weird scenario with the money or something. Uh, but the point here is that what you will send is not the real information on the quantum line. You will send some stuff that's just random, random secrets. And if some of it makes it through, then you know that, that now Alice and Bob, the two parties, that, as you usually call them, uh, they will now share secret information that the adversary definitely does not know. Uh, now secret sharing means something else. Yes. Now, now Alice and Bob are so, convinced that so they both have the same information so they, they have the and same this secret. is used yeah. as some kind of black box to kickstart so many other can, crypto systems. So now, now you can start using this uh, information that they agree on but the adversary does not know. You can use the information to actually protect your real secrets. Okay, so, so quantum encryption works, exists and can be used to make better crypto systems whereas quantum computation currently is in a somewhat hypothetical state yeah. and could hypothetically be used to break crypto yes. systems. This yes. is surprisingly complicated. Yeah. Except we should be honest and say that quantum cryptography is very limited in, in, um, in distance at which it can work. Oh, for boring physical reasons? For, unfortunately, yes. I see, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, oh. so uh, and boring, but that well, depends, well, depends things, what you're things, a physicist, I guess. But, yeah, exactly, but, yes. But, 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 but it, it's very difficult to imagine technology that would do this over more than, say, 100 kilometers on the fiber. Um, 
So, so doing this across the Atlantic, no way. Because this is so delicate. Yes. Be, be, because you have to take one element, elementary particle, have it travel from, from A to B, uh, and, and nothing must happen to its state on the way. Yeah. Okay. That, that's hard to do. Awesome. So, did we miss anything? I have I been updated? Have I been updated now on my missed twenty years of uh, crypt I, cryptography? I think you've been doing pretty good. Excellent. So um, I guess that concludes the formal part. I really wanted to learn one of your tunes, so we're going to do that in a minute. Um, to the uh, people who tuned in, thanks for tuning in. You can find the uh, previous episodes on casted.itu.dk. Um, and until next time, and now let's play some music. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so we'll, we'll do uh, Madame Blo. Madame Blo, yeah, it's one of is, yours. Uh, it's one of my tunes. Uh, it's actually uh, what we call a hopsa in Danish, which just means that there's a particular dance that goes with it. But, uh, a hopsa. Don't worry, you don't have to dance. You just have to play the guitar. <laughs> okay. okay, one, two, three, four. Thanks for joining us at Cast It. My name is Toro Husfeld, I was your host. You can find all our previous episodes at castit.itu.dk. <laughs>